I remember the first moment I went to an online interactive site. Maybe some of you do too. I grew up in Santa Monica, beach town, and I was sitting at my desk in 1994 as a young lawyer in Washington, and I went to this very first site. It was called The Spot, and it was a beach house in Santa Monica with a bunch of 20-somethings living there, and they had this written on the screen. It said, immerse yourself in sun, sand, and the secret journals of five 20-somethings living under one roof. We can also interact with you, but only if you come in. And there was actually a link under come in, and I know this sounds incredible, but I remember the moment I clicked on that link, and it felt as if the back of the computer had fallen away. It was the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe all over again. And no one could have foreseen what a dramatic change the advent of the internet and its open standards and global connectivity would have had on our lives. I remember my first email message. I'm a classmate of Larry Lessig's, and I remember how odd it was that he was speaking in lower case with that funny at symbol in the middle of it. I'm just at the right age to be at this tipping point, which is why I'm so excited about the internet and so worried about its future in America. We're undergoing around the world an equally enormous shift right now, as important as the shift we made between no electricity and electrification is the shift the world's going to make between internet access and fiber internet access. Fiber is thousands of times uh, the capacity of the ordinary internet connections that most Americans have now. It has effectively no limits on communication. It allows for equal upload and download, and that's important because fiber is the medium of connectivity for creation, for the humanities, for everybody to be able to upload as well as passively receive. So we don't know what's going to happen. Maybe we should have stopped with that beach house. It was called The Spot, by the way, if you can look back at it right now. But we, uh, I'm full of imagination of the possibilities of fiber. Fiber policy is also wireless policy. If there was fiber deep into every business and residence in Chicago, your calls would never drop because only a little tiny bit of your wireless communication is over the air. Everything else is fiber. So many other countries have taken this upgrade extremely seriously and have made sure that every single one of their residents gets access in their home or business to a globally relevant, world-class, fiber connection. That means there's signals going through glass, there's no absence, there's no gatekeeper for that connectivity, no limit on what can be done. In uh, Sweden, in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands, in Hong Kong, in Japan, in China, they're pushing towards this fiber upgrade, this tremendous new world where actually our new language will have much more to do with video than it will with text. So in Hong Kong right now, you can get, for 35 bucks a month, you can get a 500 megabit symmetrical connection up and down, $35. Compare that to what most Americans, if they subscribe to broadband, are able to get. We pay, well, in New York City, you can get 20 megabits down, the passive rece reception of signals, for $35 a month, plus maybe one or two megabits up, compared to 500 in another country that's made this upgrade, and they're making it available to all of their citizens at very low cost. That what's happened in America is that we seem unable to make this upgrade. We're unable to do it because we've fallen prey to a tremendously powerful monopoly in internet access. The story I'm going to tell you is very similar, as Andy signaled, to the one that we've experienced with electricity in America. We now think of electricity as a utility. Everybody gets it. But there was a time in the 20s when a series of rich private companies controlled electrical transmission in the country. So 90% of farmers had no electricity, while rich kids in New York City were playing with electric toys. And the electrical companies consolidated. They picked off the rich customers, got their distribution lines into those homes, and then left lots of poor people behind, and almost all the farmers. And it took tremendous leadership. It took cities saying, no, we need electricity for our citizens, and it's important for our social fabric that everybody have access. It's important for growth. It's important for just sticking with the 20th century that we all get access to electricity. It took Franklin Roosevelt 
who swam in hot springs, remember this story? And was very distressed at how expensive and rare electricity was there and took it on himself to make sure that it spread across the entire country. One of the ways he did this was to support cities who wanted to build cooperative organizations for electricity on their own. And that was a very common way of making sure people could do it for themselves. Exactly the same thing has happened with internet access. So let's say 15 years ago, uh, you could get internet access over your phone line to your home through dial-up or over a cable system also to your home through a cable modem. We had dreams about broadband over power line, other ways of getting access. Under the Bush FCC, uh, Mr. Powell, then chairman, decided that competition between cable and the telephone was going to protect Americans and keep prices down. That was the assumption on which he deregulated the entire high-speed internet access structure. The cable companies, meanwhile, had been protected from competition by exclusive franchises that they'd gotten all over the country. So even though federal law outlawed this exclusivity in 1992, between the 60s and 1992, cable was fiercely building out exclusive franchises to cities and then consolidating them so that now we have tremendously large players in the cable marketplace. Comcast is huge, and Chicago is Comcast territory, uh, and also Time Warner, and they've all bought up lots of little systems, and they never enter each other's territories. They never compete. So back again to our regulatory story. Remember I told you that we assumed that competition would protect Americans for internet access. After we made that assumption, deregulated the whole sector, Cable discovered a way to upgrade its facilities relatively cheaply to what they called broadband. So a high download connection, pretty cramped up upload, but high speed download, much less expensively than the phone companies could do the same thing. So to swap out a phone copper line for a fiber connection, it's expensive. You've got to dig up the streets, put in a new fiber connection, and start servicing people much less expensive for cable to upgrade its facilities by just swapping in new electronics. So of the 250 channels, let's say you've got in a cable system, Comcast and the other major operators can bond together three or four of those channels and provide internet access, and they can do it much more cheaply than the phone companies can. What's happened today is that the phone companies have withdrawn from the field when it comes to upgrading their facilities. They don't want to make this big switch to fiber. It's too expensive. Wall Street doesn't support them when they want to make this investment. They've left the field entirely to cable. So for 85% of Americans who want to have a high-speed uh, internet connection, their only choice is going to be their local cable incumbent. Verizon's Fios service, that fiber optic service, could compete with cable but it's only available in 15% of the country. And Comcast only competes with Verizon in 15% of its footprint. So Comcast really stands alone in offering this broadband facility within its territory. And none of the other cable operators ever enter Comcast's territory. So this is a problem uh, for America, and it's one on which I'm spending um, my human energy right now because it seems important. The cable operators have no interest in shifting away from the status quo they've got. Think of it from their perspective. They're private companies, great American companies, who have invested in this infrastructure. They have a set number of subscribers, and now they're in harvesting mode. That's why they're able to just raise prices without any correction by any oversight agency. They can put in a new fee for you to pay for a new cable modem, four bucks a month, gravy to them, no cost to them, it, and increasing cost to Americans. It's almost laughably profitable to run a cable system. Their profit margins on broadband are something like 97%. 97, it's a great business, fantastic business. And because they control this one wire to the home, they can just continue uh, doing perfect price discrimination, charging whatever you are willing to pay for a bundle of services that includes programming 
and also broadband access and also phone with no threat of competition or oversight. So we have the worst of both worlds, no competition from any other actors and no federal or local oversight that could affect the situation. And no uploads that are as good as what you can get with fiber. So the problem is the rest of the world's moving to this fiber infrastructure, far superior to what cable can offer. And so where America was the lead in the world for the first generation of internet innovation, we will not be the lead for the second generation. We're drifting farther and farther behind in our relevance as an online country. So Google and Facebook came from America, not so clear the next great inventions will come from America. And also not so clear that every American is going to get service. So moving to the second point that Andy raised, right now a quarter of Americans can't get internet access at all. It's just not available where they live. And a third, including a third in Chicago, say that it's too expensive for them. That uh, they're just not going to, they're not going to sign up because it feels like a luxury. At the same time, if you want to get access to government benefits, apply for a new job, take advantage of education opportunities, get advantage of healthcare information that's online, you have to be online. In the recent storm in New York, a key priority for New Yorkers was finding a way to get online. It feels like breathing right now. But the digital divide in America is widening. We're relegating, uh, particularly African Americans and Hispanics, rely heavily on wireless access, smartphone access, for internet access. That's not substitutable for a cable connection, much less a fiber connection. It's a second best. You wouldn't start a business using a handset or a wireless connection. You can't really apply for a job. It's difficult to you know, type up a resume on a wireless connection. Difficult to imagine educating your kids on a flaky wireless connection, the second best way of communicating. And yet, as a country, we seem to have lost the civic fabric that we had when it came to both electricity, everybody needed it, and for the telephone. All Americans got telephone access. What's interesting about communications in America is that these are hybrid companies. They serve two functions. So Comcast is both a, a very successful private American company but it's also now serving as a utility, sort of a basic input into private life, economic life, cultural life, social life. And yet its private interests, and those of the other telecommunications companies, entirely swamp its public-facing character to the point where Comcast looks forward to a future in which it will have absolutely no obligations to carry everybody's communications equally, to connect with other networks, to connect to the rest of the internet. It's looking forward to an entirely deregulated future. And so our communications capacity, our capacity to be fully functioning Americans, is subject to their goodwill, their business interests, their best wishes for us. Um, and as we've seen in the, like, in the electricity uh, comparison, it's not a good thing to have to depend on the goodwill of a private company when it comes to a utility. Like, like public safety, this is an interest that the market doesn't serve very well. Because it is expensive to serve everybody. It is expensive to expand rather than harvest. It is expensive to be a gravel pit and just get guaranteed returns. It's actually a good business to be a gravel pit, but it's not the business that these private carriers want to be in. They think of themselves much more as media companies. It's as if they're showing us first-run movies right and left. And it's outrageous. The American public is not quite aware of this issue. And uh, the reason I wrote the book was to get this on the radar screens for politicians. Every time there's a debate for office in America, you should be asking, what are you doing to bring reasonably priced, universally available, open, globally relevant internet access to Americans. What steps are you taking? How are you going to ensure that we keep up with the rest of the world and that our citizens are treated with dignity? Because to treat internet access as a commodity is to treat it as something that has a price but has no value. And actually, internet access has a deep human social value for connection. And the most 
deeply felt human need is to communicate. And yet we've left our communications futures in the hands of a few very powerful companies that are very, very tightly connected to Washington and to the center of power. So that's, that's the charge. That's why I wrote the book. Um, I'll be talking about this all across the country. And I want to deputize each one of you to be interested in internet access. So I look forward to our conversation here. I think the electricity parallel is gripping. Because when electricity first came out, we couldn't imagine its use other than for street lamps. Did you know that? People thought, oh, electricity, this seems like some kind of fad. Let's use it for street lamps. It took world's fairs, hosted here and in many other great American cities, to demonstrate to people the many uses of electricity so that their imaginations could grasp what's possible with electricity. We need world's fairs now for fiber access, for what's going to be possible when each home has that connection to the rest of the world. It's actually quite patronizing to say people don't need it, because we don't know what we're capable of yet. And we shouldn't cut ourselves off at the knees before we've even begun. So thanks very much, and I look forward to talking to Andy about this. Well, let me just. Thanks. Well, let's pick up where you left off, which yeah. is that, that over the past couple of decades, um, we have moved toward the requirement that the electric companies provide alternate electricity than their own through their wires. Yeah. We've forced the phone companies to do that. We've had a level of deregulation that at least gives you choices among phone companies and choices among elect electricity providers. Um, so is it time to impose some sorts of access requirements on Comcast and the other cable companies so that if I want to start a cable company, if I want to start an internet company, um, I can use their lines because I certainly couldn't build a whole group of new ones into your house. Absolutely. Well, you know, for more than 100 years, we've treated telegraph first and then telephone actors as regulated utilities. And, you know, the economics of the situation did not change when we added a little bit of pixie dust of internet into it. It's still extremely expensive to build this infrastructure, and we trust our communications to it. So for both telephone and telegraph, we said, you're going to be a common carrier. You can't make choices about what succeeds over your lines based on your own business interests. And we're going to obligate you not to censor. And in exchange, we will protect you against liability and will enable you to connect with all the other networks. It's actually a good deal for the common carrier. We should have the same regime now in place for the medium that's replaced the telephone which is internet access. So right now, Comcast has every reason to prefer its own business interests in running its internet connection. It has this huge stable of very powerful and popular video properties. It is going to be imposing what it calls usage-based billing, which is a way of keeping demand for internet access down for people who want to watch video. So if you are using your internet connection to watch a lot of Netflix and go over your usage cap, they'll start imposing overage charges, which will make you rear back and say, I'm not going to do that again, and go over to their video on demand. Now, it's all one big pipe. These are just digital bits. But they get to slice and dice and declare which ones get priority. That's not right for a medium to which we entrust all of our communications. It's also not right for a medium that everybody has to use to reach us. So if you're a new small video business, or new small any business, your fate is in Comcast's or the other carrier's hands. They could break your kneecaps on the way to getting to the subscriber. So and that's a real problem. I feel, so I feel good that you're my ally here. Yeah. But, but who is going to be my ally where it really matters in the corridors of power? Is it the FCC? Is it the FTC? Mm -hmm. uh, do we need Congress to, to write a whole new series of, of laws that, that kind of regulate the digital world? Or what's going to create this playing field that's going to be fair and level? Thanks for that question. We actually have a perfectly good statute uh, that Congress wrote in 1996, which would allow for just this kind of treatment. Um, Remember, Mr. Powell, under the Bush FCC, deregulated this whole sector, but he did it by just swiping the label on high-speed internet access, calling it blump instead of blip. He could go back and call it blip under the statute, and the FCC would still have all the power it needs to impose these requirements. 
What's going on right now, though, is that Verizon in the district, in the DC Circuit Court of Appeals is saying the following. They're saying, we're a speaker. We, Verizon, are just like the Chicago Tribune. Can't tell us what to do. It's unconstitutional under the First Amendment. That's Verizon's claim. And that's ultimately what Comcast is arguing, too. We're, we're special. Can't regulate us. And if they succeed in that claim, their ultimate goal is to take away from Congress the authority to regulate communications networks. And this is just like healthcare. Just keep making a constitutional argument over and over and over again until somebody agrees with you. So we actually are right now at a risk of having Congress's power removed by the carriers using the Constitution as a sword. And but the free, speech arg the free speech argument um, never, it never pre prevented the FCC from imposing right. rules and regulations and in fact enforcing imposing fines for any of the seven forbidden words that were spoken on television. In other words, uh, there was a big fine for that infamous uh, Janet Jackson uh, um, right. blip during the Super Bowl. In other words, so that argument seems to fail the test of the FCC, or it doesn't. It may not. That's, that's the risk. Uh, Verizon just will keep repeating this until a sympathetic court says yes, and then they'll take it up to the Supreme Court. And they are feeling, I think, pretty confident that when it gets to the Supreme Court, they will win, that they will be treated as a speaker. And that's, that's a risk. The FCC, you know, 100 years of communications policy will then be uprooted by this constitutional argument. It's a big problem. So it sounds as if uh, the Comcast-NBC merger was not in the best interest of the American public, at least from your viewpoint. <laughs> well, you know, watching it from, watching it from our standpoint, I didn't think much of it. I have friends at Comcast and NBC, and I, you know, hadn't thought of the implications. But it seems to me that you're, you're, you're basically, you're, you're strengthening the free speech argument when you give Comcast a, a, uh, a content distributor and filled with news, which feels fairly uh, protected under the First Amendment. So you're almost helping them fight the general public on this. The Comcast NBC merger, just for me, is useful as a lens to see how powerful these companies are and how much of our lives they touch and how easy it was actually for Comcast to get that merger through using its wisdom. You know, they're, they're very smart, they're very good lawyers and they were able to say, look, this doesn't change the situation for internet access in America because NBCU wasn't in internet access before, we weren't in content, all we're doing is putting the two things together. The problem is that the merger gives Comcast even more incentive and authority to prefer its own interests. It was already very powerful before the merger took place. Uh, I think we have an election coming up uh, I heard, in a few yeah. days. Many of the people in the room have already voted, and um, I don't think you probably know this better than me. I can't imagine that 1% of the people who voted for president even thought about digital issues when they voted. Right. But, but let me ask you, as someone who spent time with both the FCC and the, Bush and the Obama administration, has this administration done anything to protect all of us from this um, Comcast creep that we're, that we're sort of facing? And, and secondarily, um, does it matter which of the two gentlemen win on Tuesday in terms of the, are the protections you're saying need to be somehow uh, enacted by Congress? It does matter who wins. Uh, Mr. Obama has said from the beginning that he takes a backseat to no one in his uh, belief in the importance of an open internet. Mr. Romney would never say that. Mr. Romney would see these things as corner delis, you know, just private businesses like any other that should be able to price discriminate. He would not appreciate this utility argument. Um, and you can see that, in fact, from the Republican platform. So there's a clear choice between the two when it comes to internet policy. We've also, the administration has done very well globally talking about the free speech importance of the internet. I think the weakness has been more in its domestic policy, but the right DNA is there. And a second term president feeling a little freer to operate on his principles, I think would take the right steps in this direction. Well, that's what I was gonna say. You, you credit him with talking the talk, but I, it, I've seen no evidence of any walking the walk. Political life is difficult. You know that better than anybody, having spent more than 30 years reporting on politics. So I think you choose your battles, and this was not one that the administration chose to take on during its first term. It did block the AT&T T-Mobile merger, 
which would have helped uh, even greater consolidation on the wireless side of this world. So the telephone companies having backed off from wires, they've given up on DSL basically, and they're not, and people are leaving DSL in droves, and they're not installing fiber, they're focusing all of their energies on wireless. So AT&T and Verizon collectively account for more than two-thirds of the wireless market, marketplace in America and take almost all the revenue into their own hands. AT&T had sought to merge with T-Mobile, uh, which would have taken out the scrappy, plucky, last place carrier and merged it with this, the giant AT&T. And the administration did block that. So I think you good saw- Good move? Good move, absolutely good move and important. But it, they didn't then say, and this duopoly, which is what it is, of Verizon and AT&T is too powerful. And we need to make sure that they act as common carriers and they allow you to attach any devices you want to to their networks and they keep their costs reasonable and they serve everybody. They didn't ask for any of that. You know, you talked about, you, you, you told this sad story which is becoming all too familiar about this great country of ours which leads in an area and innovates and invents and develops and then for some reason watches the rest of the world. It's like the, the tortoise and the hare, you know, we get way out in front and then what do we get, complacent? Or is it, in, is it an inherent problem with the system? All of a sudden, all the other countries, uh, whether it's fiber or whatever, are taking a much more mature and healthy approach to this. And this is true in so many areas, you find. So, so how do we change this model? I mean, why are all these other countries doing it the right way and we can't? Is this part of this paralysis in our government and our politics it seems to be undermining our efforts to do anything well? Well, where consolidation is possible, competition is impossible. And we keep seeing that in America. So we initially set out a low level playing field that allows for a lot of competition, but then we, don't, we forget to worry about consolidation. <laughs> and then giant companies come together because that's the best way of making a profit. It's actually a very American thing to do. The problem is we have this civic issue of needing to give people the dignity of education healthcare, communications, and a safety net. And it's that where we seem to have forgotten our own strengths. And, but this is a relatively recent change. Over the last 30 years, this has happened. It, when I was a child, um, in, in the decades before that, we still had a sense that there were basic affordances that every American got that actually help growth. What I'm hoping for is that Republicans will see this as well as Democrats that this entire issue is about empowering a giant middle class to have the ability to spend money, make new jobs, have new ways of making a living. With growing inequality, as we're seeing in America, we're seeing stagnating growth and uh, making sure that we can act collectively to create this middle class is actually gonna help. Well, you know, historically, we've, we've allowed these monopolies and then we've attacked them and yeah. we've basically disentangled them, uh, whether it was the railroads or steel or electricity or the phones. So you're saying we're at a point now where we've kind of stumbled into an excessively monopolistic system yeah. and now we have to basically look at the unintended or intended consequences and figure out how to protect us. We've let business sort of make the original choices and now somehow government has to protect people from those choices? Yeah, and I'm not saying it's easy. I think this is gonna be a multi-year effort. I'm in it for the long haul. I think that in the campaign of 2016, this will be a central issue. Uh, and, oh, and there are bright spots here. I don't wanna be all gloom and doom. There are lots of municipalities who are trying to do this for themselves. And Chattanooga, Tennessee, has one of the fastest networks in the world right now because its Republican mayor said this is important and we wanna make sure to build fiber. Lafayette, Louisiana, same story. The Kansas City network being built by Google is quite disruptive because they're gonna be giving a symmetric gigabit connection to everybody not giving, selling, which is the right thing to do, uh, to everybody in Kansas City. My hope is that people will be jealous of the Google network and we'll, every mayor will say, well, I, why can't I have one of those? And the cable operators are now pretending that their network can do as well as Google. It's not actually not true, um, but I'm hoping that uh, other mayors will wake up but here's the risk, that you didn't know this. In 19 states in America, it's either illegal or very difficult for a town to do this for themselves because the carriers have passed legislation, they're very powerful in the state houses, that makes, makes it, uh, it's sort of anti-federalist 
takes away the power of a locality to make this decision. Well, you may not know this, but we have elected a fairly aggressive mayor in yes, the city yeah. who doesn't seem to mind ruffling feathers yeah. when it seems to serve either his interest or the common interest. Right. And his predecessor actually uh, held ComEd's feet to the fire, our electricity company, and, and basically forced a lot of reforms in the, in the distribution and the, and the overall reliability that I think have inured to everyone's benefit. Yeah. Um, is this some, we, we have a cable communication department here in the city of Chicago. Government has a cable office. Do we have the capacity at the municipal level to basically say to whether it's Comcast or uh, RCN or whomever, you do A, B, and C, or you're out of here? It depends on the city's power over its rights of way, and it depends on the city's backbone. Uh, in New York City, which is a city I, I know better, Mayor Bloomberg could say, we condition access to our streets on your providing a wholesale fiber utility for the entire five boroughs. He could do that. Well, he's a media company as well as a mayor. <laughs> yeah, well, he's, he's, a, he's everything. So what I, I, don't, I don't mean I'm not being facetious. Yeah. Does, that, does that contraindicate him doing something like yeah, that it does. when he ha when he's vested and you you do work for Bloomberg don't you don't you do I'm an advisor, an advisor. Right. but what I'm saying you know it, it, it he'd be cutting off his own nose to spite his face he'd be working for the citizens of New York but wouldn't he be undermining some of Bloomberg's distribution well and Verizon is the largest employer in New York State so it's a real problem for him politically to act with such strength so even that mayor has trouble in this area I hope your mayor has launched a fiber initiative around the University of Chicago, which is fantastic. It should reach the entire city. Good ideas don't just come from the University of Chicago. They come from, <laughs> right? They come from lots of places, so why not? Well, there's places? also been talk, there, the University of Illinois is toying with the idea of participating in the development of a whole Silicon Valley-like mm -hmm. tech center here, right. you know, from, you know, Silicon Valley, this would be the State Street Corridor, yeah. um, theory, which used to be uh, public housing and maybe now would be a corridor of, of, of high-speed uh, development. Mm -hmm. But are those the sorts of things that would drive a more intelligent approach to this? I think every spot of light I celebrate, and there are lots of them. In Cleveland now, around uh, Case Western, doctors are experimenting with brain surgery the day before they do it on data. It's like um, flight simulation, but for operations. And it's really pretty cool. And you'd want your brain surgeon to practice, right, wouldn't you? <laughs> and, and so the, the applications of this are tremendous. And also in Cleveland, they had a rock band on stage where some of the members were holographs and some weren't. And the audience couldn't tell because the connection was so fast, so blazingly fast. So at one point, the choreographer moved one person around on the stage and then went to move another. And her hands went right through him. All right, and the audience went, oh, you know, we only understand things when we see them. So that's why this World's Fair example is so important to make sure that people understand what, what effect this could have on human life, well, but for you everybody. You mentioned the 30% disconnected in yeah. Chicago, and I knew that figure, I think I even included it in a news story some years ago, and I didn't really think about it in any visceral way. But whose obligation is it to wire those people? In other words, from your explanation, it almost sounds uh, inhumane to keep a third of Chicago um, disconnected. Is it the city's responsibility? Is it the taxpayers? Should we be telling Comcast and NBC Universal? My friends there will kill me for saying this, <laughs> but should they, should they be taxed? Should they somehow have to wire everybody? Well, a couple answers to that. Uh, one is that the cable companies would probably say, look, there's access available. They just choose not to subscribe. And the response to that is, well, that's because it's too expensive. So it's all wired. Yeah, it's, all, it's probably all wired. Even in, just, even in the poorest communities where they tend probably. to have the fewest services, they would already be wired. They'd be, they'd be good to go if they, if they wanted to Probably, subscribe. that's right. And so in one of the more cynical moves around, the cable industry actually has a program for the very poorest people around. It's very hard to, to apply for. It's sort of degrading to apply for. You can't have been a Comcast subscriber in the past 90 days or something. You have to provide lots and lots of information about your personal life in order to apply. It's tied to school, school access, and so you can't apply during the summer because kids aren't in school during the summer. <laughs> and uh, it's a way for them, and it's only for a limited period, so after you've exhausted your limited period, you'll then be forced to buy something very expensive from them. It's a way to find people who are willing to pay. It's really deeply cynical, but they, they will say, 
look, we're serving poor people. We've got this cheaper program. Why don't you go apply for that? But that's all voluntary. And so the risk of that is if any regulator threatens to make them do something, they can say, oh, well, now we're going to yank that program that we were doing for poor people. So if you get into this voluntary, market-based way of running utility, you're really taking all of the power away from government and you know, its representative of the people and giving it to an entity that, that, whose incentives are not aligned. They're perfectly fine incentives, but they're not aligned with the greater social good. I have two more questions, and then we'll see if we can have a few from the audience. And the first is the most basic one. OK, this is so instructive and so informative. Uh, but then at 1.30, you go, you go back to Boston, <laughs> and everybody goes back to what they're doing. How do we keep up with this after that? In other words, uh, you don't see very many stories about this in newspapers. Yeah. You don't see them on television. I will say one thing at the risk of a, the woman out here yelling at me again. <laughs> and that is that one of the problems of covering the news in Chicago was we, really were, we, were not doing, we didn't do cable stories because they were our competitor. And it was a little bit of a conflict. So we didn't tell stories like this on our news. And I would say the same is pretty much true of the legacy news stations now, even though most of them have cable components. So that's just by way of asking you, where would you advise people to go to stay up on this conversation as it moves along without having to go so deeply into the, the granular area where you are, where the real experts are? Where do the lay people get their information here? Well, there's this wonderful sites where you can go to read about this. There's a site called Muni Broadband, which is following all the, the efforts of towns to do it for themselves. As that's a celebrated area of great activity. Uh, there are a couple of organizations that work hard on this public knowledge. I'm on their board, and they're a group in Washington, D.C. that is watching these issues. Um, but you're right, there are very few media reporters who take, this is a long-running story. This story is like global warming, okay? It has a little bit of technology. It's very incremental. There's no signal crisis. There's nothing that's just happened, although I'm hoping I can point to New York and say, you know, they can't communicate and they're miserable and think about this. Uh, it's an infrastructure story. So you need to be encouraging your reporters to write about it and hoping they don't have a conflict. That, that's really awful. Well, Matt from Motorola Solutions will suggest that everyone have their own two-way radio. <laughs> and then that would yeah, be Yeah, but that, that's it. only two-way. We need, we need everybody talking about this. This, but this should be a very big story. Is, is, are there other Susan Crawfords out there? In other words, are, are there a lot of people who are kind of the Jeremiads of this thing? Nobody does anything alone in this world. Uh, there are plenty of people who will talk about this. There's, there's a, maybe not with as much um, vehemence because they might need to make deals. I have no clients, which makes it a lot easier for me to talk about this. I, I teach, and that's the, my only form of, of income. Um, are there other, there, uh, but Do we I, have anybody locally who's like a, a, either, either a, a mentor or a, a surrogate of yours? Uh, there's a guy here in town, Michael Miranda, who works very hard on community networks, community wireless who is excellent on these subjects. Um, uh, Champaign, Illinois has a large collection of people who care about internet access. And the university there is right on top of this. And in each, in each city, there are tech meetups, people younger than me, who are starting companies and are really frustrated that they can't assume connectivity. They can't assume they're going to be able to reach their new audience. And they're ready to be organized. So, in each city, there are college students and tech meetups and you know, young advocates who really can't believe we're in this situation and are going to be voting and acting on it. OK, so my last question is, there are a couple of these anti-piracy bills that have been uh, creating a lot of pushback and pull um, mm -hmm. in DC. They have acronyms, uh, SOPA and PIPA, which basically, you know, yes, you should be protected from copyright infringement and from, and from theft of services, but then again, there's constitutional and First Amendment rights. So is there like a simple answer to whether or not these bills ought to be passed or ought to be modified? Here's the really simple thing to think about. When it comes to dirt and wires and utilities, government plays a very important role to make sure that the barriers to entry for competition uh, don't make it impossible for everybody to get service, right? So government has an obligation to make sure that everybody gets service and that it's globally terrific service. You know, the Hoover Dam was not second rate, right? So we do great things in America, and that is government's role. But that's the dirt and the wires and the transport. When it comes to content, 
the stuff that uses the internet, that rides over these connections, government's role is much more limited. And that's why there was such an eruption in response to SOPA and PIPA uh, over this last um, six months. Some of you may have read about this. A lot of uh, upset about possible censorship of sites because of copyright concerns. That's where government's role is not as appropriate. And really, there should be a light touch, hands off approach. The carriers have used people's sort of lack of knowledge about the internet to conflate these things, to say that when the FCC wants to keep costs low and make sure service is universal, that's regulating the internet. It's not. It's actually regulating internet access, which is the pipes and the wires and the physical stuff that is so expensive and that everybody needs to have access. Uh, but they're using this worry about censorship to keep us from getting involved in these monopoly situations. Is this an FCC or an FTC or both? Should, or should both be worrying about this? Well, it's uh, actually the FTC and the Department of Justice divide up antitrust authority. And traditionally, the Department of Justice worries about communications policy. So the AT&T T-Mobile merger and the Comcast merger went through the Department of Justice, not the Federal Trade Commission. So this really is a Federal Communications Commission issue for regulation of the competition issues and also a DOJ responsibility for concern about collusion and antitrust. And it, someone should look into this, you know, that the idea that these guys divided up the market and never enter. And then this last year, uh, Verizon and Comcast said that they were cooperating. So it's, you know, you take wireless, we'll take wires. Uh, so Verizon Wireless are, and Comcast are now selling their services together. They're not competing. So if Mr. Obama wins a second term, shouldn't he bring you back to the White House to, to protect all of us? <laughs> Uh. <laughs> okay, well, we have time for a few questions if anyone has any. I guess, oh, that's right, the mics are in front. So yeah. here comes, here, do we have a few minutes? Yeah, yeah we have mics. If it's possible yeah. to use the mic, yeah. please come up and do it. This gentleman's already come middle. down, so we have our first questioner. Right. Uh, I we think the way it's set up few, is though. the mics are in the very front of the room, so if a couple of you want to come down for questions, I think we have a few more minutes, but here's a gentleman. You just point. mentioned the uh, initiative in Hyde Park about the broadband. C could you explain a little bit about it? I live in Hyde Park. It sounded exciting, but what does it mean to us and to the rest of the state and the rest of the country? Well, there are these, uh, thank you very much for the question. There are a number of universities around the country who are involved in making sure that right where they are, there's high-speed connectivity. So they'll put in fiber, and then there'll be a cloud of wireless. Remember, 95% of that wireless communication is over a wire. So that's going to help that neighborhood right around. It's a demonstration case. It's like a test kitchen showing what's possible right around the university. It will help the people right there. But broadband is such a local issue. When you're sitting in your living room, you only care about what you have access to right there. So people outside Hyde Park won't necessarily feel the difference. And uh, that's a risk, for, from my perspective, for communications policy, to pick off the richer, you know, more empowered neighborhoods and leave the other ones behind seems like a mistake. I think you got to the mic first, so you go, you go ahead of this gentleman. Yes, okay. sir. There are other sites that also file the issue of uh, internet freedom. There's uh, the Center for Democracy and Technology, there's Electronic Frontier Foundation, and there's uh, and there's the and there and there's the save the internet or free press. Excellent. Those are all great sites. Yes. CD, so so cdt.org, eff.org, freepress.net, yeah. and save the internet.org are are terrific places to follow this. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, as I was uh, listening and, and trying to make sense of of all of everything that you said, it seems to me that there were that you've outlined three really distinct uh, problems. One is the, uh, the fact that uh, there's very little public policy efforts trying to get fiber into homes, and this is really critical for our social and economic advancement. Yeah. And, and, and the second issue is the inequality of access in, in existing uh, types of, uh, of um, uh, access arrangements. And then, and then the third issue um, that I got out of this was that... Be careful, someone's going to tell you to stop. No, 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 no. This is, this is great, this is great. There's, there's a, uh, there needs to be a public policy clarification 
between content and access. Yep. And uh, so, so my question is, which of these do you think is more fundamental if we only have a certain amount of you know, political um, effort to put into this, which of these three issues do you think we really need to uh, focus on or give priority to? Thank you so much. Well, as you might suspect, my answer is all of them because they all fit together. So as we make the upgrade to fiber, one in which the cable companies now have no interest, we have to make sure that we impose on that fiber these requirements of universality and openness so that no one actor can act as a gatekeeper and that we make available long-term low-cost financing to cities who want to do this for themselves. So it all fits together. We need to, as a country, make this big move and as we do it, make sure that the policy parameters are in place to make, make it make sense for everybody in America and not just for the wealthy. So, but you actually think that much more will happen if Mr. Obama is re-elected. Oh, absolutely. This, this yeah. may be considered small ball by some, but it's really important. I, you know, I don't want to promise that, okay, I, I, let's clap. I'm, I am personally looking forward to Obama 2.0. So, Mich so are Michelle and the girls. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, one, of the, one of the things that people talk about in technology development is what they call leapfrog technology, where the first adopter, as you pointed out with the internet systems, America was the first adopter. Places like Hong Kong, Amsterdam got to see what we did, and they said, oh, we can do it better, so we'll do it better. Well, now that we can see what they've done, the question becomes, how do we as a country do the next leapfrog step to right. take advantage of what they've done? And obviously that's a technological question, but how do we create the environment where this country wants to do that? That's great. Well, that's a wonderful question. I do think jealousy has a lot to do with it. <laughs> jealousy, visualization, you know, often Americans don't care about what goes on uh, you know, outside our borders. Foreign, ha, who needs it? So what's great about Kansas City is that that's local. That's gonna show us what's possible with really fast, cheap connectivity. And Google, is obligated by the city of Kansas City to let anybody do that. So it, they, they're not gonna have an exclusive on that operation in Kansas City. I was worried about that because that's just replicating the cable model all over again. But the same deals that Kansas City makes with Google, it has to offer to anybody else. And that's gonna make us all wake up and say, ah, what happened to us? Why don't we have that? That's my hope. You have time for one more question. Is that Bert? Yes. Hi. Um, women. Hi. women. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you've given us information on how we can learn yeah. more about this, but what can we, if anything, as users do to elevate the awareness? Thank you for that question. I, I think this is a political moment. This is where you ask your local representatives, your city council people, everybody can ask, what are you doing about this problem? How are you going to help us solve the digital divide issue, the access issue for Chicago? Because unfortunately, as consumers, you don't have very many choices. You can't vote with your pocketbooks and go to an open network that is less expensive because they don't exist yet in, in great numbers. So you've got to just force the political change, unfortunately, before you can vote with your pocketbook. Well, but it should be an election issue. That's what I was going to ask you. So we have no control over pricing. In other words, no. you have nowhere else to go. No. You know, so-and-so has the territory that you live in, and you've got to buy. Right. The only thing you can do is just reduce the amount of bells and whistles that you choose to pay for. Yeah, but that's hard to do if you like sports. <laughs> sports is like a sledgehammer for this whole thing. I was never going to get cable for my family. We weren't going to get it for the kids, and then Michael Jordan came along. <laughs> Couldn't live without those Bulls games. So I think that happens in one form or another to everybody. Mm -hmm. All right, well, listen, I think, I think we, have to, uh, it, we have to wrap up. Is that correct? Yep, okay, listen. Um, I just want to hold this up one Aww, more time. Thank you. Susan says this will be out in uh, a week or two. It's called Captive Audience. You can pre-order on Amazon. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> she didn't come out here to sell books, but it seems to me that it's something that would be useful for all of us to read. And uh, it's been fun. I've learned a lot, and I hope you have too, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of the Humanities Festival. Thank you very much. Thank you.